Hello all. So in the last sessions, we were discussing about best practices in developing an LP application where we have discussed about batching instances using padding, sorting and masking. And then we have seen three methods of tokenization for neural models for neural models, not character based, not word based, but sub word models. And then today we would like to, I would like to discuss about avoiding overfitting. So today's session, we would like to discuss about how do we develop efficient NLP models by avoiding overfitting. So overfitting is one of the most common and important issues we need to address when we build many machine learning, deep learning or NLP applications, right? So uh, when we talk about a machine learning model and machine learning model is said to overfit when it fits the given data so well that it loses its generalization ability to unseen data. That is, it works well with the training data, but it does not work well with the test data. In other words, the model may capture the training data very well and show very good performance on that. But when it comes to test data, it will not be able to capture its inherent patterns well and shows poor performance on the data that the model has never seen before. That is the test data, right? So because overfitting is so prevalent in machine learning, researchers and, you know, many practitioners, academicians have come up with many number of algorithms and techniques which overcomes or which will avoid overfitting in the past. So today in this session, we would like to I would like to talk about two important such techniques. One is called as regularization and the second one is called as early stopping. Okay. So regularization is one of the technique dropouts and early stopping, cross validation, callbacks. All these are different techniques that we usually adopt for avoiding overfitting. overfitting. So today I would like to majorly concentrate on regularization and early stopping techniques. Okay. So when we talk about regularization, Regularization in machine learning usually refers to techniques that will encourage the simplicity and the generalization of the model, right? So, uh, talking precisely, you can think of it as one of one form of penalty that we impose on the machine learning model to ensure that, you know, it is as generic as possible, okay? So, what does it mean? Say, uh, for example, you are building an animal classifier, as you can see here in the picture, you're building an animal classifier by training word embeddings from a corpus, okay? So, uh, we try to draw the line between animals and other stuff in this embedding space, okay? I'm trying to draw a line between animals and other stuff, okay? That is, we represent each word as a multidimensional vector and then classify whether the word describes an animal based on the coordinates of the vector, okay? To simplify this problem, let's assume that each word is a two-dimensional vector and we end up in the plot, okay, as you can see here in the figure. You can now visualize a machine learning model makes classification decision by drawing lines. As you can see, in the three pictures, I am drawing some lines to classify animals and to classify the other objects in the picture, okay. Now, the decision flips between different classes, whether they are animals or whether they are not animals. So, this is called as classification boundary. The line that I am drawing is called classification boundary. Okay. Now, how would we draw classification boundary so that, you know, the animals in the blue circles and separated from everything else? That is the triangles. Okay. So, one simplest way to separate animals is to draw one straight line. Usually, we prefer drawing one straight line as you can see here in the figure, figure one. Okay. The plot one. Okay. This simple classifier makes several mistakes as you can see in classifying the words like hot and bat. Okay. As you can see, we have some discrepancy here but it correctly classifies the majority of data points except these two majority of the data points are correctly classified now this sounds like a good start okay now what if you are told that the decision boundary does not have to be a straight line okay then you may want to draw something like you know uh, the one shown in the middle here in the second diagram okay now this one looks better it makes fewer mistakes than the first one because chocolate, pizza are separated except this one pot which is put there, right? So, it makes fewer mistakes than the first one although it is still not perfect, okay? It appears tractable for a machine learning model because the shape is very simple, okay? But there is nothing that stops you here. If you want to make as few errors as possible, you can also draw something wiggly, 
okay like in the third figure okay the decision boundary doesn't even make any classification errors okay this hot chocolate and pizza are out animals dog bat and carrot put into one category okay now the decision boundary does not make any classification error which means that we have achieved 100% classification accuracy okay not so fast remember remember that up till up until here we have been thinking only about training time but the main purpose of machine learning model is to achieve good classification performance at the test time also now let's think how the three decision boundaries described earlier fare at test time classification is in training is okay but how does these three classification models behave at the test time okay if we assume this test sentence test instances are distributed you know similarly to the training instances as we have seen in this particular figure the new animal points are most likely to fall in the upper right region of the plot okay the first two decision boundaries will achieve decent accuracy by classifying majority of new instances correctly okay but how about the third one what will we do with the third one training instances such as hot as you can see training instances such as hot shown in this plot are more likely exceptions rather than they are norm okay so the curved sections of the decision boundary that try to accommodate as many training instances as possible may do more harm than good at the test time by inadvertently misclassifying test instances this is how what overfitting looks like the model fits the training data so well that it sacrifices its generalization ability which is what happening here okay now then the question is how can we avoid your model look like the third decision boundary after all it is doing a very good job correctly okay there is no point in that classifying the training data if you look only at the training accuracy and of the there would be nothing to stop you from choosing it so one way to avoid overfitting is to use a separate held out data set which is called as validation data set not just training and test but we will use validation data set that will validate the performance of our model okay but can we do this even without using a separate data set yes. the third decision boundary okay the third decision boundary just doesn't look right it's overly complex so with all other things being equal we should prefer simpler models because in general simpler model generalize better this is also in line with ockham's razor which we have studied in machine learning which states that the simpler the solution is preferable to a more complex one right so how can we balance between the training fit and the simplicity of the model okay then regularization comes into play okay so think of regularization as additional constraints imposed on the model so that simpler and or more general models are preferred so the model is optimized so that it achieves the best training fit while being as generic as possible so what about numeric regularization techniques okay so numerous regularization techniques have been proposed in machine learning because overfitting is such an important topic okay so we are going to introduce only uh, you know uh, few of the most important topics here in this session today so one such a regularization technique is called as l2 regularization or we simply call it as weight decay okay so this is one of the most common or most important uh, concept of regularization okay so l2 regularization also called as weight decay is one of the most regularization methods not just for nlp or deep learning but for wide range of machine learning models okay so we are not going into the mathematical details and all that stuff here in the session because we already know what regularization is all about but in short L2 regularization adds a penalty for a complex of the model. The more complex your model, it adds a penalty. Okay, uh, because you know more the complex model, more parameters does it have. Okay, so to represent a complex classification boundary, an ML model will need to adjust a large number of parameters, which we usually call as magic constraint constants, to extreme values measured by the L2 loss, which captures how far. they are from the zero okay such models incur a large l2 penalty which is why l2 encourages simpler models as simple as that okay 
So if you're interested in learning more about elder regularization, you can just uh, check various textbooks on machine learning and deep learning which we have studied earlier. Okay. Next, I would like to talk about dropout. Another regularization technique which is called as dropout. Okay. So dropout is another popular regularization technique commonly used with uh, the neural networks especially. So dropout works by randomly dropping neurons. Okay. So all of us know what is dropping neurons during training because uh, where a neuron is basically a dimension of an intermediate layer and dropping means to mask with zeros. Okay. So basically you can think of dropout as a penalty of the model to the model structure's complexity and its reliance on particular features and values. Okay. So as a result, the network tries to make the best guess with the remaining smaller number of values which forces it to a generalized model. Okay. Dropout is actually very easy to implement. Okay, so uh, it is very easy to implement and effective in practice and is used as a default regularization technique. Out of L2 dropout and L stopping, we use dropout as a you know default regularization method in most of the deep learning models. We have developed so many case studies, right? We have worked on so many case studies where we use dropout as a default regularization technique. Okay. Next, I would like to talk about early stopping. Okay, so this is another popular approach for combating overfitting in machine learning or deep learning or NLP models. Okay. Uh, early stopping is basically a simple technique where you can stop training your model when the model performance stops improving. Okay. So instead of wasting time, usually measured by the validation set loss, we will plot the learning curves where we built an English span machine translation model. Okay. So we've already discussed about building a translation model, right? So we will stop the training. Uh, we will stop training the model when the model performance stops improving. There's no point in executing the perform uh, model when the performance is degrading, right? So you can notice that you know uh, the validation loss curve. Okay, here the validation loss curve. Here we have training loss curve in orange, validation loss curve in blue. So the validation loss curve flattens around the eighth epoch, as you can see. Here around the eighth epoch, the validation uh, curve flattens. Okay, and starts to creep after that, which is sign of overfitting. So early stopping basically would detect this, stop the training and use the result from the best epoch when the loss is lowest. Okay, so in general, early stopping has a patience parameter, which is the number of non-improving epochs for early stopping to kick in. Okay, so when patience is 10, 10 epochs, for example, the training pipeline will wait 10 epochs after the loss stops improving to stop the training. Okay. Now, why does early stop help mitigate overfitting? What does it have to do with the model? Getting into mathematical details, it takes some time training a box for the model to learn complex overfitted decision boundaries. Most models usually, you know, uh, most models usually start from something simple, that is, trade decision lines, and gradually increase their complexity over the course of training. Basically, understand that. By stopping the training early, that is early stopping, can prevent the model from becoming overly complex. Okay, so many NLP or many machine learning frameworks have built in support for early stopping. Okay, so you have BERT based models, BERT based neural, neural network architecture, wherein you know a language preference model we use early stopping with patience is equal to 10 without paying much attention. Right, so you can use this as a default parameter for avoiding overfitting okay now the next topic that i want to discuss uh, when we talk about avoiding overfitting is cross validation okay cross validation is not exactly a regulation method okay so don't get confused here it is not exactly a regularization method but this is one of the most important techniques which is commonly used in machine learning okay now to explain you this well i would like to talk about a common situation in building and validating a machine learning model. Okay, so you have only a couple of hundred instances available for training. Okay, uh, you can't really train reliable ML model just on the training set. We need to separate a set for validation and preferably another set for testing. That is, we divide the entire data into training data, test data, and validation data. Okay, now the point here is. How much you use for validation or testing depends on the task and size of the data set. In general, it is advised that we set aside 5 to 20% of your training instances for validation or setting. 
Even 30 is also fine. 70% of training data, remaining 34 uh, test and validation. Which means that if your training data is small, your model is validated and tested on just a few dozen instances, which can make the estimated metric unstable. Okay. So the basic idea of validation is to iterate the phase. I, when I talk about iteration, splitting the data set into training and validation portions multiple times. As you can see, I am doing this multiple times with different splits to improve the stability of the result. Specifically, in a typical setting, we call this as K-fold cross-validation. That is, you first split the data set into K different portions, okay, of equal size called folds, okay. You use one of the folds for validation while training the model on the rest, okay. For validation, we use one part and the remaining for training. K minus 1 times for training. And repeat this process K times using different folds. As you can see here, I have used fold 1 to fold 5 for validation every time. Okay. So, as you can see here in the figure, I have used fold 1 to fold 5. Okay. The validation metrics are usually computed for every fold. And the final metrics are averaged. Okay, for every fold, we calculate the validation metric and the final would be the average of all the iteration. Okay, so in this way, we can obtain a more stable estimate of the evaluation metrics that are not impacted heavily by the way the data set is split. Okay, so the most common use of cross-validation in deep learning models or NLP models is because, uh, you know, uh, they don't need a... Uh, large amount of data. Okay, you don't need cross validation if you have large data set. Although its use is more common and more traditional in industrial settings where the amount of training data is basically limited. Okay, so this is all about uh, avoiding overfitting by regularization. In regularization, we have L2 regularization, dropouts, and early stopping. Along with that, we also have cross validation. Okay, so this is all about how do we avoid overfit in the NLP models. Thank you.